Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. There's probably more of you watching from home this morning because of the weather. Uh, we're still going to do church. The 11 a.m. service is going on about this time or will happen shortly whenever you're watching this. Not sure, but I know many of you uh, new viewers today. So welcome. Uh, I'm in the studio today. We're in the studio. The last few weeks we've been in here and we'll probably continue that until Easter Sunday when we film live and then air during the week. But So we're here in the studio and uh, just so blessed to be able to um, talk through the book of 1 Peter. And this is it. Like today's the last day of, uh, of the series. And we've been talking uh, through the book, covering every verse. A very timely book because Peter talking about how to get it right in a world that's so wrong. And so this is very timely for you and I as we navigate through all kinds of things. And I know it's been challenging in many different ways, but I hope it's been helpful. I hope it's been helpful. I know it's really helped me. I try to preach to myself first, and, uh, and then it then comes to you guys. So we're going to go through it today. So far, uh, we've talked about having the right foundation, the right focus, uh, the, the right reputation, the right relationships, the right response. Uh, last week, uh, we talked about the right attitude. And so today, we're going to kind of wrap up uh, this series. And uh, I want to talk to you today about the right, the right responsibility, the right, having the right responsibility. Because at the end of the day, you and I, as believers in Jesus, we have a responsibility you know, um, as we love and live for Jesus and to try to get it right, you know, we have a part to play in this. We just can't give up responsibility. So here's the thing. If we refuse to take responsibility, then we'll never get it right. If we don't take resp responsibility for our actions, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, uh, we'll never, we'll never get it right. So we got to take responsibility. Now, I don't know about uh, your upbringing at all. I know I, I have great parents, and they're both um, I'm very thankful. They're both still alive. Great parents, great role models, great examples. And hopefully you had the same experience that I had, but uh, my, my parents really, you know, um, took it upon themselves to teach me responsibility, how to take responsibility for my actions. And I've quoted my dad many times. He said, Chip, you made your bed, so then you gotta you gotta lie in it. You know, basically you chose this, and so you need to reap the consequences. And sometimes those were good, sometimes not so good. Many times when I was a teenager, not so good. So I learned that I had to take responsibility. And so we instill that in, in our kids, that same that same thought process, that same idea that we want them to be responsible, responsible for their actions, responsible for uh, their behavior. And so, uh, like, for example, with school, you know, they, we set parameters, we set guidelines, there's, there's rewards and there's consequences for grades, and we don't get on them, we don't bug them, we just say, here's what it is, here's what we expect, and it's your responsibility to get these grades that we expect. And if not, there'll be consequences. And I've discovered personally, and also with our kids, that uh, they'll get it. You know, if they have to, you know, um, uh, experience some negative consequences based on their actions, and next time, yeah, they kind of own it, and it's a little better. It's hard as parents to do that, but it's it's really good for them. So many parents today are letting their kids off the hook, not teaching them responsibility. So Peter's saying, hey, if you're going to get it right in a world that's so wrong, you must take responsibility. You got to be responsible for your actions. And so we're going to look at four areas this morning as we uh, tackle chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5. So first, first of all, we have a responsibility to focus. And, and specifically, he's talking about church uh, leadership or church eldership. And I think he's making the point here, when the church is challenged, when believers are challenged and they're part of a church body, leadership, eldership, needs to step it up and to um, take the lead, set the example. And so we got we to gotta focus. We have a responsibility as leaders, as elders, to focus you know, on, on leadership so that we can impact those that we are responsible to, 
to oversee and to, and to lead. And so uh, read with me as we take on 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. Peter says, to the elders, to the elders among you. He's talking to church elders, eldership. We have elders at First Baptist Church. They're the, the leaders, uh, the shepherds. They, they oversee the flock. Uh, so to the church elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder. So Peter, also an elder, as a fellow, as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings. So Peter, a fellow elder, and he also witnessed the sufferings of Jesus. He saw it firsthand. Who also will share in the glory to be revealed. There's going to be a glory that's revealed. Uh, and he says in verse 2, be shepherds, that's what elders do, be shepherds of God's flock, that's the church body of believers, that is under your care. So as elders, as church elders, we have a responsibility to care for our flock, you guys, the, the people who attend the church. And he explains, watching over them, not because you must do it, no, not because of that, but because you're willing to do it. There's, you're not forced to do it, but you're willing to do it. It's a responsibility. It's a calling, as God wants you to be. And then he says, not pursuing dishonest gain. Don't do it for the wrong reason. right? Don't make it about money or yourself, but do it because you're eager to serve. That's what he says. Not lording it over those entrusted to you. No, not, not you know, really kind of putting your foot down on people in a very hard, manipulative way way that's, you know, just lording over them. He says, don't do it that way. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. That's what elders do. That's what leaders do. We, we set the example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, that's what Peter says. Notice he says when and not if. <laughs> not if the chief shepherd appears. Who's the chief shepherd? It's Jesus. Jesus. So, when Jesus appears, the chief shepherd, the chief elder appears, you will receive, he's talking to elders who get it right, who do it right, who take responsibility for the leadership, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Like this is, this is what you go for. So again, he's talking to church elders, church leaders, church shepherds. As I look in scripture, I see that this is a, a male a male position. Uh, and so here at First Baptist Church, we, we, we believe in the Bible, of course, the living and abiding Word of God, uh, refers to male eldership. So I know that's definitely a hot topic these days in our country and in, in different churches. So I, I'm very quick to say this. The Bible teaches male eldership or male oversight in the church, but also strongly affirms women in leadership. So we hold to male eldership as the biblical example, the biblical model. We follow that model here at the church. We have male elders, but we also highly value women as leaders, big time. Uh, just thinking on the top of my head, there are many women in our church uh, who hold leadership positions and do a wonderful job, an incredible job. And really, uh, women have so much to contribute, and they bless me, and they bless you, and so many in our church. And so we, I try to be very careful when I talk about eldership, male eldership, to right alongside it say, but we also believe in women, women in leadership, and we we do, we practice that here. And so he talks mainly to male elders. But this could also, what he's saying here, could also be applied to leaders, whether you're men or women and you lead a ministry, maybe you're not an elder. You could also learn from this, these principles here. So he says three things in this passage that we need, to, that we need to, to focus on. First of all, elders, leaders, need to focus on feeding the flock. We have to make sure that we feed the flock, that they have the spiritual disciplines necessary to to grow. So we teach from the Word of God every Sunday. You know, all of our ministries, kids and children's, our connection groups, our sermon-based connection groups, based from the Word of God. We, we, we strongly adhere to teaching and living by God's Word. And so the messages that you hear are, are biblical messages. And we'll do topical things, but they, even those topical messages come from a, uh, a Bible verse or, or, or many verses. 
And so uh, our job as elders is to, is to feed you, is to give you the word in a way that you, uh, educates, relates, and then motivates you to live it out. So it's not just about feeding you so you get fat. It's feeding you so you have the energy and the ability and the resources to do something with what you've been taught. So as James says, we are to be doers of the word. So we, we take in the word, um, elders teach us the word, and we live out the word. So elders focus on feeding the flock. That's what leaders do. Number two, we focus on, he talks about focusing on oversight. Oversight. So that's that's protecting the flock. And, and so elders protect the flock. They protect us uh, in the church. So protection from attack on the outside, but also discord on the inside where, where people rise up and they try to break apart the flock of God, the church, in many different ways. Elders step up and take a stand. You know, they're, they're very, they're, they're loving, uh, very loving and kind and gentle and, and caring, but they're also very alert. And at times they can be firm saying, you know, we're not going to put up with this at God's church. We love his church and love you too much for allow this behavior to continue. So focus on feeding, focus on oversight. And number three, elders are to focus on being the example. Listen, the right example is crucial, absolutely necessary and crucial if we're going to inspire right living. So you need to see what that looks like. I think about what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. He says, follow me. Paul says, follow me as I follow Jesus, as I imitate Jesus. And so as elders, as leaders, we need to imitate Jesus, follow Jesus, love and live for Jesus, so that you, the flock, you see what it looks like. And it's one thing for us to say it. It's another thing for us to do it. That's why many times when I preach, I give you biblical truth, but I also share about what that looks like in my life. Many of you know, know my story. You've heard all my stories many different times. And I do that for a reason, to, to set the example. I say, here's, how, here's what I'm learning. Here's what I'm chewing on. Here's how I'm growing and developing so that you can see it firsthand, uh, lived out. And so that is, that is our job. And, and so many years ago, I don't know how many years ago, four or five years ago, we were challenged. Uh, we were challenged as elders to keep each other accountable with reading the Bible. And so at el every elder meeting, we go around the room and we ask each other, how many times have you missed reading the Bible this past month? And so we go around the room and people say, you know, m mostly it's minus zero. Every once in a while, there'll be a minus one or a minus two. For the most part, we've been hitting pretty close to 100% every month. And when we first started, I, you know, we first started, I've, I've told this story before, we first started doing that, I would, I would miss four every month because I, I wouldn't read the Bible on Sunday because it was a preaching day. I would just kind of review or whatever, and I never counted that as reading the Bible devotionally. So I miss four every month. So every month I'll report four. And then I thought to myself, well, if we're keeping track, we're keeping track for a reason. The, the goal should be 100%. It should be. Why, if not, why keep track? So I thought, you know what, I got to set the example. And so I just, about four or five years ago, I've never missed a day. I, I, I read the scripture every, every day. I haven't missed for four or five years. It's, it's crazy. Um, and it's, it's good. And so I think that's why our numbers are up with elders. You know, it's positive peer pressure. But we set the example for you. If we want you to read the word, live by the word, then we need to do the same thing. So we have a responsibility to focus. Number two he goes on and says, we have a responsibility to follow, to focus on leadership, but also uh, follow. So he goes on um, and talks about how following is probably just as important as leading. So leaders need good followers. So Jesus is our leader. We need to be good followers. And that's the same thing with the church. Elders are God-ordained leaders, you know, shepherds. And now Peter says, you got to be good Followers. So he goes on, verses 5, 6, and 7 of chapter 5, and says, In the same way, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. Elders. All of you, all of you, everybody now, everybody, all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, 
be humble towards one another because God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. God values uh, humility. Uh, and he, and he she, I mean, Jesus was the, the ultimate, he was the epitome of humility, right? So he set the example. God values humility, not pride. Humble yourselves, verse 6, therefore under God's mighty hand, so that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your cares, cast all your anxiety, you know, the things that just kind of pull you in so many different ways. He goes, take that and just cast it on him. Why? Because he cares for you. And that takes, that takes humility. You know, that, that, that means, you know, God, you're, you're bigger than me. I can't handle this, God. I admit it. I admit it. I can't handle it. You can. So I take these things that are stretching me and pulling me in so many different ways, and I, and I just throw them over to you. And here's the thing. God wants us to do that. He's asking for it. You know, it, it's, it's imperative that we do that. So we have a responsibility to focus on leadership, but also a responsibility, number two, to follow. So he says three important things in this passage that we need to do here when it comes to um, following. So number one, it's, it's very simple, but it's following leadership, following leadership. It's trusting church elders, those shepherds that God has put in authority over us to kind of lead us, to guide us, to set the example. Now, you've got to remember, elders are human, uh, sinners just like you. And so we make mistakes, so we can't expect them to be perfect. But we got to believe that God's called them and they're seeking God, trying to love and live for Jesus in, in every different way and trusting God's agenda. So I, I'll tell you this, uh, I just love our elders. I've, I've experienced elders for I don't know how many years as a pastor. We have great elders here at the church. And we always say this, you know, we come in, we come in with ideas, but we come in as elders, though, holding on to them loosely, seeking God's agenda. So we really try to pray about the big things that we're going through, you know, and uh, we, pray, we pray at every elders meeting and we pray personally. And uh, we come in and say, God, what's your agenda? What's your plan? What do you want for us? And so here's the thing. In order for our church to grow or any church to grow or any organization to grow, change is essential. So elders are behind that change and they approve a lot of these changes or sometimes come up with these changes and, and they need followers to support them. You can question them. You can, you can talk to them about the change and, and get follow-up ideas or and if it's, you don't think it's biblical, you can go to them one-on-one -on -one and talk to them about it or whatever. But at the end of the day, you know, we got we to gotta follow leadership and entrust God in the process that they're following him. Not only do we follow leadership, but we enhance fellowship. Number two, we enhance fellowship. So if we're going to be good followers, we have a responsibility to follow well. We need to follow leadership, but also enhance fellowship. So our connection with one another in the body of Christ is essential. No lone, no lone ranger Christians... You know, we need each other. We were created for community. God is community. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Uh, we also were created for community. I need you. You need me. We need each other. we got to enhance fellowship. We do life together. I love our connection groups. Man, we, we, you know, we started those a few years ago, and they've grown so much, and I love hearing how you guys are connecting with one another, doing life together with one another. And if you're not in a group, you can simply email eric at livingalegacy.church and Eric will help get you plugged into a connection group and, uh, and help you get connected with each other. We do life together. I love our group and, and uh, I know that they love being in it and many of you enjoy being in a group. And if you're not a part, uh, you need to do your part. And also on Sunday morning, too, it's not just your connection group piece, but Sunday morning is taking ownership of church. It's saying, you know what? I don't know that person. I'm going to go over and introduce myself. It might be embarrassing. They might be here for a couple of years. I didn't know, but I don't know. I'm going to go and connect, or I'm going to help people, or I'm going to serve, or I'm going to enhance fellowship. Follow leadership, enhance fellowship. And number three, acknowledge lordship. Lordship is the process of making Jesus the Lord or the leader of your life. So that's where Peter says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. It's making Jesus Lord, Jesus leader, 
It's humbling before him. He's ultimate authority. Now, lordship, lordship isn't for uh, justification or for salvation. So G- making Jesus Lord, it's, it's obeying him and following him and doing what he says. Like, you don't do that for salvation. You know, God did the work through Jesus for us. We can't work our way to heaven. So really, lordship, making Jesus Lord and leader, is a lot about sanctification. It's after we have accepted Jesus, after we've been justified, we now to be sanctified, and that's by following him as leader and Lord. He calls his shots in not just one area of our life, but the goal is in every area of our life. So we gotta, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to focus as leaders, and then we have a responsibility, number two, to follow. He goes on in our passage. Number three, we have a responsibility to fight. Focus, follow, and number three, we have a responsibility to fight. So let me remind you, we don't fight for the victory. Instead, we fight from the victory. The victory has been won through Jesus. He died for our sin. We have not, we have forgiveness of sins. He conquered sin, conquered death. They buried him. Yay, we won, but they didn't. He rose again the third day. Jesus is victorious. He is alive. He connected with 500 or so people after he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father, preparing a place for us. We have the victory. We need to claim victory, live in the victory, right? But there is this fight and this struggle because we have this sinful nature still within us that wages war with the new nature. The new nature is a winner, but there's going to be a battle this side of heaven. So we need to remember we have a responsibility to fight, but we don't fight for the victory. We fight from the victory because we are victorious through Jesus. In verses 8 and 9, Peter says, be alert, be alert and of sober mind. Why? Why would he say that? Because he says he knows firsthand. He knows firsthand about the enemy, about Satan himself, because he says, your enemy, the devil. I know this guy. He's like, your enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You know, he doesn't want to just kind of blare around. He wants to devour us. The enemy wants to destroy us, devour us. So he says in verse 9, resist him. Now we can resist him because of what Jesus did for us. We have the victory. So I can resist the enemy because of Jesus. I can't do it without Jesus, but with Jesus, we can do all things. Resist him, standing firm, he says, in what? In the faith. I'm going to stand firm in my faith in Jesus. Because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Yeah, you're suffering. Yeah, you're being tempted. Yeah, you're going through a tough time. Yeah, it's tough and difficult. Yeah, you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. But here's the thing. You're not alone. I'm not alone. You're not alone. Peter reminds us it's not just about you. There's other people going through this too. And they're making it. You can make it. And they're making it because of their faith in Jesus, their trust in Jesus, their dependence upon Jesus. He's... He's the answer. He's always the answer. So what Peter does here in this responsibility to fight section is he talks about he talks about our enemy. And he says basically four things here. First off, our, since our enemy is real, we need to be informed. Our enemy is real. Satan is real. So we should be informed, right? He's not a, he's not a safe Satan like the cartoonist, you know, a little red fun little guy with a pitchfork and little red jammies, you know, saying, hey, do this. No, he's not a safe Satan. He's dangerous. He is a a wild animal looking to devour us, consume us, doesn't care a lick about us. So he's saying, you know, you 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 need to realize that our enemy is real, so be informed. Study the scripture, study what he does and doesn't do, who he turns to, what are his tactics and all that stuff. Number two, we learn that our enemy is active, so we should be alert. Our enemy is always active, never never sleeping around on the job, always active, so we have to be alert. Our enemy, the more we go after Jesus, the more our enemy goes after us. He will not let up. He will not give up. The more we follow, 
The more we follow, the more he attacks. So our enemy is active. We've got to be alert. Number three, we learn that our enemy is strategic, so we must be wise. We've got to be wise. This is knowing your buttons, knowing your triggers, knowing those things that tempt you to do wrong, that set you off, you know, spiritually, emotionally, physically, sexually, whatever it may be. Know your buttons. Your buttons are different than my buttons. I have my buttons. You have your buttons. I know my buttons. I know what I can or can't do. And I, I know the enemy knows them and he knows when to push them. And so I have to be aware, have, have people in my life that will support me, pray with me and for me and, and help cover me with, you know, with prayerful protection. We need each other for that. So we, we got to be wise. We got to be careful. You know, we got to know our weak areas and we got to be very alert and we need to get help at times and support from others. If you know you're entering a season of temptation, your buttons are being pushed and you're tired or whatever, you got to call people. Again, we need each other. The more quiet you are about sin, the more it's, it will overtake you. We got to have one another. And then the fourth thing we learn about our enemy is the fact that our enemy is, is defeated. So we need to be positive. No more Debbie Downer Christians. And that makes no sense to me. Christians who have accepted Jesus, sins are forgiven, go into heaven. We have all the resources that we need through the scripture, the Holy Spirit. We are more than conquerors in Christ. But yet so many Christians are down and just, ugh. You know, I get it. We're going to have tough times. We're going to have very difficult times. We're going to suffer. We see people in the scripture suffer. And you're real about the suffering. You acknowledge the suffering. I hate the suffering. I don't like the persecution. I don't like the evil, right? But at the end of the day, I'm refusing to be down about it, negative about it. I'm going to choose joy. Joy says this. Joy says, God, I don't like it. I don't get it, but I'm going to trust you. And when we trust God, he gives us this peace that surpasses all understanding. And we have this ability to be joyful because of Jesus, because of our trust in him. And so our enemy is defeated. We got to be positive. Positivity celebrates the victory of Jesus. So we have a responsibility. Let's review. We have a responsibility to focus, talking about leadership. We have a responsibility to follow. That's follow followership. Uh, number three, we have a responsibility to fight, but we don't fight for it. We fight from it. Praise be to Jesus, our enemy is defeated. We can be positive and proactive. There's one more thing he talks about as we finish out this series on how to get it right in a world that gets it wrong. We have a responsibility to finish. When we talk about finishing, we're talking about finishing well. Talking about when we're in heaven with Jesus, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about finishing well. We're talking about getting it right. And so read with me as we finish out the chapter, starting with verse 10 through 14. Peter says, And the God of all grace, that's who he is. He's the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ. After you've suffered a little while, and we will suffer as Christians, it's coming. Will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. That's what suffering does. He wants to strengthen us, uh, grow us. To him, verse 11, be the power forever and ever. Amen. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I've written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. The true grace of God for you. God's undeserved favor for you. This is what it's about. He's saved you, rescued you, delivered you. It's going to be tough, but he's going to get you through it. And there's glory at the end of the tunnel. Stand fast, he says. Stand fast in the grace of God. And then she who is in Babylon, considered by many to be Rome in that time, a very evil place, uh, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Okay, this is pre-COVID. <laughs> kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Peace. Don't, don't miss that. Peace to all of you who are what? Who are in 
Christ. In Christ because of your faith in Jesus Christ alone. Not in your works, but his work on the cross. It's that good. So we got to finish. we got to finish well. And he mentions five things here. You see, number one, we can finish well by trusting God's character. We can finish well. You can finish well. I can finish well by trusting God's character. He's that good. In fact, Peter calls him the God of, the God of grace. He's the God of grace. So we're not always going to get it wrong. We're not going to, I mean, I'm sorry. We're not always going to get it right. Many times we're going to get it wrong. But we can, we can trust in the God of grace to get back on our feet again, to forgive our sins, and we just go after it again. We go after it again. Many times I've gotten it wrong, able to confess and get back on my feet and go after it again. It's finishing well. Finishing well is trusting in God's character, his grace. Number two, we can finish well by trusting in God's condition. What is God's condition? His condition is not our works to earn his favor. His condition is Jesus. His, his offering and sacrifice for our sins. For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus, his son, who died for us, that whoever believes in him, Jesus, shall not perish or have eternal life. Jesus is the condition for eternal life. So we finish well by trusting in God's character, God's condition, Jesus. And then number three, we can finish well by trusting in God's calling. He's called us. He's called us to, to follow him, to, to love him, to, to live for him. That's, that's his calling on our life. And I, uh, I'll tell you this, calling, and I, I've, I've learned this as a pastor, um, and I've been trying to teach this to Eric, and I think he, he fully understands it. Calling, God's calling on our life will get us through anything. Life is rough and tough, difficult and challenging. But if you, you depend on God's calling, God's called you to do this. And you look at the circumstances surrounding your calling, you know he's called you to do it. It'll get you through anything. So I would say this, when you go through times, the rough and tough, difficult and challenging, always depend upon your calling as a believer in Jesus or what he's called you to do specifically as a follower of Jesus. We can also finish well, number four, by trusting in God's curriculum. <laughs> God's curriculum. God's curriculum, we've talked about this through this book of 1 Peter. God's curriculum, and many times, it's the word of God, but it's also suffering. When we go through evil, persecution, and suffering, that's, that's part of God's curriculum. It's, it's, it's not a bad thing. In many cases, it's a God thing because it grows us. Why does it grow us? Because... We're, we can't do it. We can't handle it. And so it, it really puts us in a situation to trust in God more. You know, it really challenges our faith. It increases our faith, our dependence upon God even more. So it's finishing well. And, and number five, he says, we can finish well by trusting in God's compensation. His compensation. And when we talk about compensation, we're talking about eternal life with our Savior Jesus because of our belief in him when we accepted him. But also, we're talking about eternal rewards in heaven for you and I who seek to get it right in a world that's so wrong. So as a believer in Jesus, I'm going to heaven because of my faith in Jesus Christ alone. It's faith in Christ alone plus nothing else. But I can get rewards in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ for believers by, by getting it right, by trusting him and doing it his, his way, following his path and his plan for his honor and for, for his glory. So he says, you know, we have a responsibility here. As we close out the book, we have a responsibility. Responsibility to focus, a responsibility to follow, a responsibility to fight, and responsibility to finish, to finish well. He's talking about how to get it right in a world that's so wrong. I'll tell you this. The bottom line that Peter gets to here throughout this letter, the bottom line is Jesus. Getting it right in all those different areas we've talked about is all about Jesus. Why? Because Jesus got it right for us. He got it right for us. And so when we believe in Jesus and follow Jesus, you know, we're able to get it right. Not what we do, it's what he has done for us. And we give it all to him. We commit to him and we love him and we live for him. Jesus is the answer. In fact, Jesus is always 
the answer. So if we're going to get it right, and the world is so wrong, I pray, my prayer for you, the church, and many others that are watching, is that you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And then you make the decision, like I have, and many of you have already, is to fully follow Jesus. Not because we have to, but because we want to. We get to. And my friends, when we do that, we're going to get it right in a world that's so wrong. Heavenly Father, we love you, praise you, and thank you. I pray for our church family and many watching this morning that we would draw near to you, Jesus, would trust you, love you, and live for you. Thank you for, for coming into our world and saving us and rescuing us so that we can, we can get it right. And we owe it all to you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, have a great day. Stay warm. Look forward to seeing you soon, and uh, take care.